Great. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And guten Morgen to Unso because it's 7 a.m. here in Berlin. My name is Han Young Lee or Yi Han Young in Korean. And it's so lovely to meet you all. What I'm going to share today is my immigration story as an Asian woman. Four years ago, I did not know much about Germany other than beer and sausages. The only German words I knew were Guten Tag, Danke, and Ich liebe dich from my high school music class. So moving to Berlin was basically taking a leap of faith. Let me tell you what the last four years have been like afterwards. Spoiler alert, it was not happily ever after. I structured the flow to cover three keywords, live, study, and work. Along the way, the presentation will touch upon the topics such as my thoughts on recognizing identity, how I coped with discrimination, and the ongoing pursuit of purpose to manifest why I am here. This is my timeline to give you the context on a personal level. I quit my job in the exciting Korean impact investing sector to move to Berlin in August 2018. I took German language classes for one year and started my master's program at Minerva University, which was 100% virtual from the United States. I took advantage of being a graduate student to start working as a working student, which is a very German specific program here in the finance team at a German telecommunications startup when the coronavirus started to appear all over the news. I studied and worked simultaneously on a corner of the dining table at home for two years until I finished the master's program and got promoted to the permanent position as finance and impact manager last year. Fast forward to now, I've been working as a freelancer to translate, interpret, and provide financial services. At this point, I guess you might have a couple of questions or not. Hopefully most of them will be covered in the next half an hour, but if not, please feel free to leave it in the link. Um, no, actually, no. Please feel free to keep it until the Q&A session later. This is the context of immigration on a national level to give you a rough sketch of immigration in Germany. As of 2021, people with a migration background make up approximately 25% of the German population. What I found interesting was that the source of the official statistics categorized Turkey, Syria, and Afghanistan under Asia. I infer from this that what Germans think of Asia is so broad and encompasses a variety of cultural spectrums. This could be a juicy discussion topic later. Okay, time to deep dive into my story. Let's start with the keyword live. First, why Berlin? Why did I move to Berlin out of all the places in the world? There were so many factors playing behind the scene, but the simplest reason to explain was love. I met a German guy while traveling in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Three months into dating, I asked him if he wants to live with me away from Korea. Back in 2018, I was burned out from Seoul life. I was desperate to leave the country I love hated. I traveled once to Berlin in 2016 and it left me with such a great impression for 10 days that I wanted to go back to live there. And then out of nowhere, a German native popped into my life. Originally, I planned to go to an American graduate school before turning 30, but a chain of serendipity turned into the knot of the lifelong bond. And this is how I solved the visa issue, by the way, um, which can be one of the toughest bureaucratic barriers to living abroad. Out of curiosity, a quick survey here. What are the first words or images that come to your mind when you think of Germany? 
um, please feel free to raise hand or leave your comments in the chat. Anyone who wants to speak up at this point? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I think of beer, sausage, and soccer. <laughs> when I soccer. Yeah. Yes, beer, sausages, and soccer are really going all together. And here people say football. And when I said soccer, they were like, no, no, we don't say that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, before moving here, I only had good memories from a short trip, apart from the general impressions, as Hua mentioned, and on the German people, such as being punctual, direct, serious, or sticking to rules all the time. I was so naive to believe that as a model country that regrets historical wrongdoings openly and welcomes refugees, I wouldn't experience harsh discriminations like in the US. And guess what? It was not long before my fantasy was destroyed. The first big event I was involved with was the de demonstration against the sexist, racist, and discriminatory advertisement. A lot of people got so angry back in 2019 that a group called Asian Women Solidarity organized a protest in front of the advertisement agency office in Berlin. I volunteered to moderate the demonstration, which aimed to break the silence. Because one of the Asian stereotypes, especially against women, is that we are obedient, we don't argue back, and we stay silent even when things go sour. About 100 people gather that day. Let's watch the two minute long video together. Please understand that I would rather keep the video size small because the first minute grosses me out. Oh no, we don't have a sound. Ah, you can't hear the sound? But actually it's not a problem because it's just the background music without any comment. Please um, pay attention to all these um, subtitles that pop up in the video. So are you able to see, even though without sound, sorry for no sound, I think that really made this Zoom, yeah, hard to control. Great. Okay, any comments on the video or your feedback? 
please feel free to raise hand or share a emoji <laughs> for your reaction. No, okay. Then let me share what I felt. The Hornbach uh, protest was, oh, sorry. You can check the chat. Oh, okay. Yes, thanks, Juhi. It was really disgusting, and so did so did I feel. Finn also commented that I remember that a lot of Germans found it very funny at the time. Exactly. Yes. So they couldn't really empathize with how we felt as Asian women or Asian societies in general. Thank you for your comments and sharing your thoughts. The Hornbach protest was a reality check of the visceral kind for me. Of course, I had a few incidents of discriminatory experiences before then, but it was a clear alarm to brace up to face the real side of German society. I was shaken and relieved at the same time back then. Shaken because the majority of German people seem to take this advertisement as humorous, yet relieved to see a handful of friends that felt the same problem and acted to tackle it together. This was also the moment that I started to think about intersectionality. I didn't know the term back then, but I felt it. I identified myself as a feminist in Korea or actually anywhere. In Germany, I felt that my Korean ethnicity and Asian appearance put more layers on top of being a straight, cisgender, and able-bodied woman. It was more complex than fighting against femicide and anti-abortion. In Korea, the root target was the patriarchal norm. However, intersectionality brings in so much more nuances and different contexts than just being a woman unfairly treated. The dictionary definition sounded overcomplicated. Instead, let me quote Lay Chandler to understand the concept of intersectionality. Intersectionality theory asserts that people are often disadvantaged by multiple sources of oppression, their race, class, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, and other identity markers. Intersectionality recognizes that identity markers like woman and black do not exist independently of each other and that each informs the others, often creating a complex convergence of oppression. One of the few precious friends I have in Berlin is a big K-drama fan. She is from India and she fell in love with the Korean TV series since the pandemic broke out. And that brought her even to name her cat Kimchi. I happened to be the first Korean friend she met. One day she asked me a series of questions about Korean culture, social norms, trends, and so on based on her K-drama impressions. Some of the questions were about the areas that I have zero interest in. After answering, I don't know, or I, I don't like it a few times, she jokingly said, I'm fake Korean. We left together and moved on to a different topic. But honestly speaking, I felt embarrassed and even a bit offended while disguising my feelings in laughter at that moment. Fake Korean. Well, I couldn't pinpoint why. Now that I reflect on it, I had a flash of negative feelings, not because someone questioned my nationality, but because I was judged with an oversimplified perspective. Don't get me wrong, um, I still value her as a dear friend and she said it with no intention to mock or humiliate me. It was a joke. But still, I believe judging a person based on one aspect like nationality is so dangerous. Here I wrote down a few stereotypes about Korean. How many do you think are true? What makes you think so? Does not ticking all boxes here make a person less or fake Korean? Humans are complex beings. Now I believe there's no such thing as common sense. So I try to replace extreme expressions 
such as all, never, or always with most, most of the time. In a similar vein, I realized that I also had so many stereotypes about Germans, like they're punctual, accurate, or efficient. When I dealt with German government officials, unfortunately, most of the positive stereotypes were broken. The endless papers to submit and waiting indefinitely, like in the movie Zootopia. My point is, there is no point framing someone with a certain stereotype because every single person has different or intersectional characteristics in different contexts. So whenever I meet someone, I try to assume as little as possible. Next, let me talk about the second keyword, study. I graduated with a Master of Science in Decision Analysis at Minerva University. In short, it's called MDA. It's a San Francisco-based edutech startup-based school that claims to offer an innovative pedagogy based on the science of learning. As you can see from the screenshot of the Minerva Forum, it looks very similar to Zoom, but you cannot turn off your video. So it is their own um, creation. And as you can see on the top line, uh, the faculty and classmates were from the US, Canada, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, and China. The MDA program is designed for working professionals in different fields to engage in a virtual classroom setting. One cohort doesn't exceed 10 people to encourage active interactions and discussions. The goal of this program was for students to be driven to make evidence-based, data-informed decisions and enact positive impact in the world. Each discussion-based seminar starts with an opening poll and wraps up with a closing poll. Everyone is expected to read the given materials before the seminar. So this is a flipped classroom approach. I use Notion, as you can see on the left-hand side, to archive my pre-class notes as an open book for each session. Because every session pushes one to continuously engage with others in different formats, I was exhausted after the 90 minute session was over. I had three to five cold calls from a professor on average per class, and we had a lot of breakout sessions to write codes or solve given problems together. With courses covering complex systems analysis, logic, and problem solving techniques, research methods and information-based decision-making, students gain the interdisciplinary knowledge and practical skills like Python or R. From the program, I learned to challenge assumptions, analyze information and hidden intentions. Most importantly, it reshaped the way I think about the world by being conscious of my own bias with critical thinking approaches. In the last semester, everyone could choose one's own area of interest and research method for writing a thesis. I was interested in choosing a topic that could encompass women's empowerment and environmental sustainability to find the implications for sustainable development goals. The long title and the summary slide from my thesis defense were a part of the deliver deliverables, as you can see here. It was a painstaking process, but believe me or not, I had so much fun learning new facts and conducting research. And based on my own findings, I came to believe that empowering women is a great leverage point to create positive changes. And this brings me to the third keyword, work. I was lucky to not have to worry about the visa status since I had a partner visa. This gave me a certain degree of freedom to explore various types of work that I felt relatable, 
such as working as a remote contractor to support a one-woman-based startup in Korea, or participating in a research team to conduct case studies for women-led businesses in Asia. While wrapping up my thesis, I had a great chance to work as a researcher. The project organizer called Umentum was based in Singapore, and the Korean research team lead was in New Zealand. Three other Korean teammates were in Seoul, which enabled us to meet online only. We interviewed 20 female founders or CEOs in Korea to learn how women-led or women-owned businesses transformed in the era of digitalization, largely incurred by the pandemic. The same research took place in Vietnam and in Singapore in parallel to publish the comprehensive case study report in English and Korean. Momentum has published a lot of interesting works publicly available online. So if you're interested, please check out the website as um, I have the link here with the source. Alongside the master's program, I worked as finance assistant at a Berlin-based telecommunication startup for almost one and a half years. Because I wanted to apply what I learned from master's program, I wrote my own job description to pitch a new role as finance and impact manager before converting to a full-time position. The startup was growing double every six months with new developers coming from different countries like India, Pakistan, or Ukraine. It was a diverse team in terms of nationality, yet CEO, CTO, and all the chief positions were only male. In the tech scene, I believe more women in leadership position enhances the performance, working culture, and ultimately profits. For that end, I wrote the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Policy, or DEI, of the company, organized unconscious bias training, small cultural exchange events with the cross-functional task force team. I also worked closely with the people team to source more women in the recruitment pipeline. I think you don't have to listen to that um, promotional video, so let me skip it. And currently I am working as a freelancer for a living, but have side hustles to empower unheard voices to connect Germany and Korea. One of such attempts was writing a series of 10 essays in an independent newsletter in Korean to introduce vegan environmentally conscious lifestyle. This year, I have been collaborating closely with a, with a Vietnamese women-led publisher to create a trilingual children's book to introduce Korean culture to the German and English speaking audience. Also, I am cooking up another idea to deliver voices across the borders. It is an ongoing journey, but my time in Berlin to live, study, and work until now taught me that immigrants can identify themselves as entrepreneurs in a broad sense. By definition, an entrepreneur is a person who starts a new business to solve a problem and who is willing to risk losses. I believe anyone who leaves their native home country to settle down in a different environment is an entrepreneur because we dare to start something new with a clean slate. Another takeaway is that good solution to reduce discrimination or fight against discriminations are mutual respect, solidarity with the disadvantaged, and building a community for collective powers. For this, I manifest my mission to empower minor voices like women, people of color, and LGBTQ plus communities. This is the purpose that guides my decisions every day here, and this is why I am here. Thank you or danke for your attention. Please feel free to send me an email, email or connect on LinkedIn if you have any feedback or questions. Thank you, that's it from my side.